come to family theology time. Would you mind turning that off? It just came up at the same time. So, a family theology time, we are going to be... Ooh, dizzy. Um, we're going to be stepping back. I'm all right, I think. The world is spinning. We're going to be stepping back and thinking about the authority of Scripture. You know, I, I skipped over that. But we're going to come back to that. And just very briefly, um, I want to overview the, the issue connected with the authority of Scripture. So if you're in the book, we're on page 100, but we're going to be skipping a lot of it because um, we're um, going to be passing on to the passing on through the issue of authority next time to inerrancy. And I've I've skipped over um, a good deal of the good deal of this deliberately. I dealt with the clarity and the um, sufficiency. sufficiency of Scripture, which is really just a part of this subject. But I want to back up now and just talk briefly about the authority, um, because well, all sorts of people claim authority. Let's pray. Mm. And we'll get into our subject. Father in heaven, thank you for your your word. Thank you that we can come before you and try to understand it. We pray for your help. We pray for your forgiveness. We pray for your enabling now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so first question. Um, what are we talking about when we're talking about authority? What is authority. Okay, authority is basically the issue of who's in charge. And authority is, I know, they've put some dictionary definitions in here which are helpful. Um, da, 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 da. The power or right to enforce obedience, moral or legal supremacy, right to command or give a final decision. In, in, the, in the New Testament, the, the word translated authority is exousia, exousia and, it, and the definition of that is power exercised by rulers or others in high position by virtue of their office. But the basic idea is for ordinary people like us, who don't necessarily read dictionary definitions for everything, the basic idea is who's in charge. Who has the power to tell other people what to do? And the reason we're talking about this in connection with Scripture is obviously, well, the Bible claims that it's given by God, doesn't it? The Bible also claims that God made the universe. Mm -hmm. um, God made it everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you say, well, okay, that should give him certain rights of ownership over the universe, shouldn't it? So according to the Bible, God is the creator, therefore God is also the one who owns the universe. Um, and that's made explicit, Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell they're in. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted it put explicitly in a verse, Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth belongs to God. God's the owner. God's the creator. He's the owner. He's also the one, according to the Bible, who's going to wrap it all up. 2 Peter 3, 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with the roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. God created it. God owns it. God's going to destroy it and remake it. Answer to the question, who's in charge? According to the Bible, very simple, God is in charge. Now, um, according to 
the world, all sorts of different people are in charge, aren't they? <laughs> and that's really significant for us because, look, um, you know, there are today, and the reason I've come back to this is, you know, I read this the other day and I didn't think this was very important for us. And I was thinking over it some more today and just thinking, well, you know what, today there are so many claims by different people, different types of people claiming authority. And there are people who even counterclaim that there is no authority, which is, by the way, kind of an authoritative claim. <laughs> um, you know, they would say, well, power to the people. Mm. Well, that's what they mean by that, is we the people have the right to make decisions. We are ultimately in charge. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because ultimately in charge, according to the Bible, always goes back to God. Why are we talking about this in reference to the inspiration of Scripture and the doctrine of Scripture? Well, because not only according to the Bible is God the owner and God the authority in this world, but God has spoken. Now, think about that for a moment. If God has spoken, if God's word is God's word, <coughs> and God has given us truth, <coughs> Well, then you would say that truth has authority, doesn't it? That truth is the ultimate standard for us. That mm -hmm. truth is the ultimate um, power which we must obey, is, is God and his word, his spoken word, his written word, is our source of authority. Now... You can believe that, and I believe that, and then you can go to university, mm. you can go to college, you can study something, mm. and you'll meet all kinds of other authorities. The authority of, of experts in their fields, and, and people will even say, oh, this person is an authority on this subject. In other words, they know, they have spoken, and when they have spoken, other people go, oh, okay. Because they know so much about this particular subject that they're considered the authority. Well, you're very intoxicating, by the way. You go to university, you start studying, and you've got some professor who knows all sorts of things you've never even read about in the Bible, but they, everyone looks at them as the authority. And when they speak about stuff, people just believe them and people follow them and people obey them. I had an interesting conversation with someone the other day who, you know, was, was basically telling me, well, you can't disagree with this because the scientists say so. <laughs> and, I, and I pointed out to this uh, nice chat that I was having a friendly debate with him um, but I pointed out to him that a few moments earlier he had been disagreeing with the scientific consensus over another issue and now he was telling me that I had to agree with the scientific consensus over this issue and he didn't seem to see the irony of his position but that's just the way things are I mean people put scientists out there as the authority or maybe political idealists so maybe someone comes up with a theory like socialism and there are people out there who read about it and then they just say well this this is the authority why because we think it's a really good idea um, maybe 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 you're going to encounter that, and you've got to, you'll have to you'll have to then come up against this question: Who is really my authority? Do I really believe 
this authority put forward and recognised by everyone else when it contradicts God's word on an issue. Now, um, another aspect of this is the question of how do you how do you know that God's word is the authority? How can you decide God's word is the authority? And as you read through this chapter, I'm not going to take you through everything, but that's really the essence of this chapter is that there's kind of secondary ways that you can come to decide that the Bible is the authority. There are certain rational evidences that you can look at and conclude based on um, making observations and looking at the history of the world and seeing, well, okay, the Bible does seem to line up with the history of the world in a way that proves it to be authoritative. And then there's church authority and um, the church makes decisions and says that we believe the Bible and and you can look at the way the Bible impacts people and you can say, well, the Bible really does transform people. It really works. And that can be seen as some kind of authority. But ultimately, if none of that was available to you, um, uh, you, you still have the Bible kind of testifying to itself. And so the primary source of our for, for our understanding of why and how and the, the Bible is the authority, is the Bible itself. You read the Bible, the Holy Spirit testifies to your soul that the Bible is true, it bears witness to the truth of the Scripture, but as you read the Bible, it authenticates itself. That's why the clarity um, of Scripture is such an important issue because the Bible is examinable. Now, um, as we come to the end of this, it's going to be very brief today. I think the the end product is quite important for us to discuss. If you look at page 107, um, you'll see the seven points in conclusion. The outworking of God's authority in Scripture can be summarized by a series of negative, what it is not, and positive, what it is, statements. You'll want to follow along with those. <coughs> read them from here. Um, so let's just have a look at these statements because this is going to give us a little bit of, I think, very helpful closing um, information on the, the issue of the authority of Scripture. Okay. It is not derived authority bestowed by humans. Rather, it is the original authority of God. Okay, so God's authority in Scripture um, is not derived, given by humans, it's actually the original authority by God. So God spoke, and the fact that God spoke means that the Bible is authoritative, the fact that he's the creator. We didn't make him in charge. Mm. We didn't elect him. In fact, if you're going to say, mm -hmm. if God, if, if this world was... If the authority in this world was some kind of vote, uh, Satan would be in charge every time. Um, it's God does not win the popular vote. Let's put it like that. But but that doesn't mean he's not in charge. It doesn't mean he doesn't have the power. It's just he has authority. Number two, it does not change with the times the culture, the nation, or the ethnic background. And that's really important for us to say, isn't it? 
that, okay, just because we're dealing with something that's centuries old, um, doesn't mean it's outdated if it, we're really talking about God and his authority. If it was true then, people ridicule that, don't they? Mm. They say, well, yeah, that might, that might have been good centuries ago, mm -hmm. but you're, you're talking about, it was talking about the 21st century now. Yeah. By the way, remember that people said that in the 20th century, mm -hmm. and the 19th century, mm -hmm. and the 18th mm -hmm. century, and the 17th century. And you can, read the, you can read those exact statements. We're now living in the 17th century. We're not primitive people, you know. And he's like, hold on a minute. Um, it's the same pattern. It's the same pattern, yeah. Okay, um, so it doesn't change with the times, the culture, the nation, or the ethnic background. That's another argument people make. It's all very well for you. You're white mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're British. Mm -hmm. um, well, Jesus wasn't. Mm -hmm. That's the answer to that one. <laughs> okay, verse 3. It is not one authority among many possible spiritual authorities. Rather, it is the exclusive spiritual authority of God. Now, that's helpful, isn't it? To think about this. If God has spoken, which he has, if God um, claims to be who he is, and if indeed that's true, which I believe it is, mm. well then, God's the only authority. And Muhammad isn't. Mm. And Buddha isn't. And, and all these competing claims, Krishna and the like, they fall. In fact, you can go to Philippians 2, and at the end of Philippians 2, you realize that one day every knee is going to bow to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's every, every, everything. And everything in the whole universe is going to be brought under his authority. Number four, it's not an authority that can be successfully challenged or rightfully overthrown. Rather, it's the permanent authority of God. If, if the Bible's true, God isn't going to be, be done away with any time soon. Number five, it's not a relativistic or relativistic or subordinate authority. Rather, it's the ultimate mm -hmm. authority of God. Number six, did I say six already? Number six, it is not merely a suggestive authority, rather it's the obligatory authority. Mm. And that's something which people really struggle with, isn't it? The Bible is, just comes over that way. People read it and they say, well, I don't like this because, mm. you know, we're taught to, to kind of put forward ideas for other people's consideration. Hmm. Now, when God spoke, did he say, now I've got a nice idea here that I'd like you to consider. No, why not? Well, because if you have the right to consider it and mm. decide whether it's authoritative or not, who's actually in charge? Mm. That's you, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> You just put yourself in charge. Well, according to the Bible, you're not in charge. Mm. And so it's not suggestive authority. This is the authority of a king who says uh, to people like me, I, I, I'm a preacher, but in the Bible I, I could be called a herald. My job is not to make up the message. It's not to, not to pass on the message. It's to deliver it. It's like God says you must repent now <laughs> signed god in the bible i don't get to share that message i i have to deliver that message from god that's where it's a it's a message of a king that not just a king but the king of kings that we read Okay, so it's not so just a suggestive authority, it's obligatory. You are obliged to, to obey if you disobey. Finally, 
it's not a benign authority in its outcome, rather it's consequential authority. If you, do not, if you disobey it, there are consequences. It's not just, oh good, Jesus is in, Jesus is in charge, we're all going to get Christmas presents. No, it's Jesus is in charge, <laughs> you need to repent and believe the good news and he'll save your soul. But if you won't repent, Jesus is coming and judgment is coming. There are consequences. So that's the authority issue. And you can back up and you say, well, what has this got to do with the clarity um, of Scripture? Well, um, I put it to you the other day that every word of God proves true. You can test it, this. You can come to the Bible. It, it, it withstands examination. As you examine it, what you're brought face to face with is not just an interesting idea. It's not just a set of spiritual guidelines for you. It's not, it's none of, it's, I mean, it, it, it does give you spiritual guidelines. It is an interesting idea, but it's far more than that. It's the, it's the reality that you're brought face to face with as you read the Bible. And you can't escape this. You read the Bible, it's clear, God has spoken. And he's not a God that you can mess with. Mm -hmm. And so the scripture claims authority for itself. The word of God. Well, that's something we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray that you'd help each one of us to deal with it appropriately, rightly, in a way that brings you glory. That you deliver us of from our inward rebelliousness that resists and rejects that authority, that wants to put ourselves upon the throne. And we ask you to Lord, bow the knee, that, that we would bow, be able to bow the knee before you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, we are done. And I'm figuring out how to do this. I'm going to say we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. Bye-bye for now. Not tomorrow, next time. Mm -hmm.